What's up guys? Welcome to another episode of Engine University, the YouTube equivalent of a university course. In today's Engine University episode, we'll look at a turbocharger in depth. We'll start small and easy by learning how the turbo works and what components make up a turbocharger. Then we'll take a close look at its internals, explaining and covering the fundamental ideas linked to turbocharging. So sit back, relax, and let's go deep into the turbo. To support our channel and see more content similar to this one, you can subscribe and like the video before continuing. Don't forget to turn on notifications. Let's go on. The most fundamental observation about a turbocharger is that it has two sides, hot and cold. The hot side contains the turbine wheel, while the cold side houses the compressor wheel. All turbos are mounted to the engine on the hot side. This component of the turbo has a flange that is fastened to your engine's exhaust manifold. Turbos can employ several types of flanges or a V-band clamping method. As your engine runs, it produces exhaust gases. These exhaust gases would ordinarily be wasted, but with a turbocharged engine, these hot and fast-moving gases are employed to power the turbine. As exhaust gas enters the turbine housing, it spins the turbine wheel. The cold side of the turbo contains the compressor wheel. The compressor wheel is permanently connected to the turbine wheel via a shared shaft. As a result, spinning the turbine wheel causes the compressor wheel to spin as well. The compressor wheel form is intended to draw air into the turbocharger. It is known as the compressor wheel because it is used for more than just sucking air. It also plays a crucial role in compressing the air, which is then routed through the compressor housing into your engine's intake manifold and combustion chamber. This compression of air is what allows turbocharged engines to produce greater power at atmospheric pressure, which is the usual air pressure we all experience. There is a specific amount of air in a particular volume. Assume you have a four-cylinder engine with a displacement of 1.6 liters. This indicates that one of your cylinders has 400 cubic centimeters of displacement or volume. For the purpose of simplicity, let us assume that at normal atmospheric pressure, there are 1 million molecules of air in that single cylinder. An engine produces power by combusting air and fuel, resulting in an explosion that propels the piston. The more air and gasoline in your cylinders, the more power you'll generate. So how can you generate additional power? You just expand the capacity or number of your cylinders to allow for more air and fuel, resulting in larger explosions and, eventually, more power. So, instead of a 1.6-liter four-cylinder, you have a 3-liter or 6-cylinder engine, and presto, you have greater power. Yes, the new engine is heavier and bigger, but who cares? What if there was another method to increase power without increasing engine size and weight? As previously stated, the turbocharger compresses air. This implies that it actually packs more air into the same cylinder capacity. So let's return to our 400 cubic centimeter cylinder, which contains 1 million air molecules at atmospheric pressure. Let's add a turbo to the mix. A turbocharger compresses the air. So the molecules are now closer together, resulting in more of them in the same amount of space. So, instead of 1 million molecules in the cylinder, it now contains 1.5 million molecules of air, and you may increase the quantity of fuel provided to that engine. You produce more powerful explosions with the same cylinder volume. The engine size has not grown, but the power certainly has. As you can see, installing a turbocharger or raising the pressure on an existing turbocharger increases the volume of air that enters the engine. However, engines require a specific air-to-fuel ratio to generate power, which means you must increase the amount of fuel as you increase the amount of air. So when the turbo compresses the air, it increases the pressure of the air, which raises the obvious question of how we manage the amount of pressure that a turbo creates and how we ensure that the turbo does not compress the air too little or too much. Because without control, the turbo would just keep pressurizing the air until the extra pressure caused something to fail. Enter the wastegate, which controls the amount of pressure generated by the turbo. The wastegate system consists of two components, the wastegate itself and a wastegate actuator. The actuator is attached to the compressor housing via this hose. This implies that any pressure generated by the compressor is also transferred to the actuator via the hose. The actuator contains a diaphragm and a spring. When the pressure becomes sufficient to overcome the resistance of the spring, the actuator will move from its resting position and, because it is physically attached to the waste gate, will open it. When compressed air reaches the inside, the compressor will generate pressure. 
so you can see how pressure opens the waste gate. The waste gate opens, allowing exhaust gases to escape before they reach the turbine wheel. This means that the turbo will slow down and stop producing as much pressure. The mechanism you've just seen is an interior waste gate. This signifies that it is a waste gate that is built into the turbo itself. However, turbocharged engines can also have external waste gates that are distinct from the turbo. So we keep stating how the compressor will raise his air pressure, but how does it do so? To fully comprehend how the turbo produces pressure, we must disassemble it. So we remove the wastegate actuator, compressor housing, and turbine housing, leaving only the turbo core or cartridge. As a result, the turbo housing and cartridge plate play an important role in air pressure regulation. When these two components come together, they form the diffuser. The diffuser converts the turbulent, fast-moving low-pressure air from the compressor wheel into slow-moving high-pressure air. To see how this works, consider the ideal gas law. Now I won't bother you with any formulae. All you need to know about the ideal gas law is that gas pressure and volume are inversely related. This indicates that when volume reduces, pressure increases, and vice versa. The diffuser's design involves a considerable decrease in volume. The compressor wheel propels and stuffs air into the restricted opening which this boat slows and pressurizes. The air then passes via the volute and enters the engine. Now, let's look at the turbo core, which is made up of the turbine and compressor wheels, as well as the middle portion. The shaft and a few holes are located in the central part. This turbo is oil and water cooled, including inlets and outputs for engine oil and coolant. Some turbos are simply oil cooled, while others, albeit less frequent, are neither water nor oil cooled. Water cooling is typically advantageous since it helps keep engine oil temperatures under control. The turbo creates enormous quantities of heat, which can cause increases in oil temperature. This might affect the life of your turbo and engine. Coolant running through the turbo helps to keep oil temperatures steady. Almost all automobile turbochargers use a radial compressor wheel. This implies it sucks air in one direction while compressing it in another. In most circumstances, the air entrance direction is skewed by 90 degrees. Turbochargers can also feature axial compressor wheels, but they are uncommon in automobiles and more prevalent in trucks and industrial machinery. The jet engine is also an axial air compressor since it compresses air in the same direction as it moves. Compressor and turbine wheels are seldom removed or disassembled from the cartridge at turbochargers. Because these turbochargers spin at incredibly high RPM, typically exceeding 100,000 RPM. Some turbos may achieve speeds of 200,000 RPM. This is why it is vital to correctly balance the turbocharger. A turbo is dynamically balanced by spinning on a machine at its working RPM. The machine then calculates where weight should be eliminated to attain perfect equilibria. This is quite similar to the process of dynamically balancing a crankshaft, and you will notice dimples on your crankshaft where weight was removed to achieve perfect balance. The turbo is balanced with the core completely constructed, which implies that removing the compressor or the turbo wheels would distort. However, you can try to restore the wheels to their original position by marking them and retaining the nuts. This is frequently physically impossible. You may get close, but you will never get it back to the exact same position they were in. As a result, you may be shortening the turbo's lifespan, which is obviously undesirable. So there you have it, this video was basically a turbo one by one study of all of its components. I hope you liked this video and found it interesting and enlightening. As always, thank you for watching, and I'll see you soon with more fun and informative content on the Engine University channel.